Hello and welcome. This is Lockdown TV from Unheard. Um, the mention of Lockdown TV reminds me that I want to put out to you what we should be calling ourselves in the post-lockdown era. Uh, so please make suggestions down in the comments. Uh, at some point when lockdown is formally over, I guess we should call ourselves something else. So uh, let's have thoughts on that. Uh, today's guest uh, is very special, and I'm really delighted that he has made the time to join us. Uh, this is John Gray, uh, who joins us. Hello, John. Can you hear me and see me? I can see you and hear you very well, Freddie. Very nice to be talking. So, um, John, you are, you are Professor Emeritus of European Thought at the London School of Economics. You are um, a very eminent philosopher and expert on the history of thought. The question we'd really like to know is, with all of your experience and having watched political philosophy and politics for these decades, um, do you feel that now, this moment we're in, is one of those big change moments, whether it's, you know, 1848 or 1917 or 1968 or whatever? Are we at a moment of revolution, whether that's political or, or societal? Um, or does it just sort of feel like that and might we just carry on rather as we have been. Do you think we're at a moment of change? I think we're in a moment of deep and large change. Um, if you ask me what was the closest to this situation and this experience that I can recall in my life, it would be the um, collapse of communism in 1989-1991, which uh, uh, was an irreversible change. It was also unexpected. Uh, right up almost to the footfall of the Berlin Wall. There weren't very many people who thought the whole system of communism would collapse. And it did change everything in the world um, for many reasons, one of which was it created a new phase of globalization. Because it brought into world markets and seemingly at the time brought into global democracy, democratic governments, uh, countries that had been shut out of it for... Um, uh, in the case of Russia, 70 years, in the case of uh, uh, Eastern Europe, the Soviet bloc and the Baltic states, less than that. And of course, it was also, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, part of a, a larger movement whereby central planning, insulated economies, socialist economies, were disappearing all over the world, including, though without a revolution, in, in China. Um, so it was a huge shift, unexpected, irreversible. Use. The two forces that really brought down communism were not economic. It hadn't worked, the economic system in the Soviet Union, right from the start, actually, it hadn't worked well. Um, uh, they were nationalism and religion. And interestingly, they were the same forces that were underestimated in Western liberalism at that time. They were regarded as forces which had um, faded to a large extent, so that what was coming about was a, a form of global liberalism in which these uh, um, intra these commitments, these identities, as we would now say, national and religious identities, would become almost like um, um, uh, uh, ethnic cuisines, mm. just as you could have in the same street half a dozen different ethnic restaurants you could have in the world many um, um, uh, national and religious identities, but they would not be deciding of forces and events. That was the idea that was very, very strong. And I think when I got the clue, not only to the collapse of the Soviet regime and of communism, but also of the larger globalized order that would emerge from it, mm. was, when it I it was when I realized that the forces behind this weren't, as nearly everyone said in the West, it's because the economic system doesn't work, or it's because they've embraced our form of liberalism, which is what Fukuyama and many others thought at the time. That it wasn't at all like they weren't the reasons. The reasons were um, the, that uh, the Soviet-style regimes imposed upon their populations identities and values that they didn't recognize as their own. So as soon as cracks appeared, whether in Poland or in um, in the Baltic states, or whenever a, a big reform project emerged, as it did in Gorbachev, they saw their chance. And mm. then it couldn't be long before it collapsed. If we fast forward 30 odd years to the current moment, yeah. or the, the recent, the last few years, do you think it's those same forces then that, 
you talked about being kind of um, overlooked or undervalued mm -hmm. that are still driving events? I do, although uh, those forces are still driving events, um, uh, but in, sometimes in ways that's not immediately obvious. So, for example, I think the, um, the, the movements within liberal societies, the movements within what used to be called um, the liberal West, uh, on the left are very often religious movements with a secular gloss, particularly in intensely religious societies as the United States. When you see people being baptized on the streets where George Floyd uh, was killed, was murdered, you know that something's going on there, which is, uh, has a, a strong religious sense. When you look at the language of a new world and of uh, um, wash, the washing of feet and all these pretty explicitly religious practices and symbolisms, you feel that religion is still there and very strong indeed. Of course, in many other respects in the 30 years in between the fall of communism and now, uh, religion has been has revived as a force deciding events in uh, uh, Islamism. It's, it's a strange form of religion and a strange form of Islam, but it is an explicitly fundamentalist religious movement of the kind that, again, back in the 80s, uh, very few people ex expected. I would say even in the early 90s, uh, not many people thought that um, uh, some of the great political movements of the future uh, would also be religious movements. And of course, nationalism has come back, again, as part of something larger, um, uh, not only in Europe, uh, where there are uh, 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 where the, Euro the, the, the European project is under stress in many countries, Brexit, as I argued before Brexit and still argue, was not an outlier. Was not a, uh, uh, a strange European, a strange British um, uh, exceptionalism. Brexit was just the first of many forms of stress and strain within the European project. Um, uh, in which um, national identities and other identities were being asserted against uh, the European uh, project. So nationalism has certainly come back. But I think the larger phenomenon that's happening now is that at the time when, at a time when internally in liberal societies, there are very powerful movements questioning and even rejecting a large part of the inheritance of liberalism, particularly rejecting what I think are still its most valuable element, which we should actually not be rejecting, but cherishing uh, tolerance, the practice of tolerance, which means the tolerance of different attitudes and beliefs and theories and, and religions, uh, 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 but also free inquiry, the willingness to follow free inquiry where it goes, regardless of political uh, commitments. Those two aspects are being widely objected. But at the same time, something which is uh, relatively new, but just more and more stark, is the way in which some of the world's biggest states are, uh, some of the world's most important and powerful states, are representing themselves as really civilization separate from the West. Mm. China does that, worldwide Confucius Institute. Russia, under Putin, uh, uh, asserts that it's Eurasian power and not a European or a Western power. India, increasingly, uh, under Modi, says it harbors uh, a particular uh, Hindu civilization. It's partly a power play by the current ruling elite. Uh, 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 th th that is a way of legitimating their position. But there's also a reality in it, because although this was definitely not recognized by very many people at the time, what the fall of communism was in Russia was the failure of a Western Enlightenment project. Lenin uh, always said he uh, was a disciple of uh, the 1848 revolutions and before that of the French Jacobins. He saw himself as Westernizing uh, Russia. Even for a while, he saw himself as Americanizing it because he talked about bringing in Taylorism, which was the model of um, factory organization that was pioneered in, um, in, in, in America. And as soon as it happened, I thought, this is not the triumph of a Western, the, the Western European Enlightenment project of communism is not going to be replaced in Russia by another uh, Western project, that's to say liberal democracy. It's not going to happen for all kinds of 
historical and other reasons. Um, what's going to happen is that the uh, centuries-long tilt of Russia between the West and Asia, it's questions about what kind of power it is, what kind of state it's going to have, will be resolved in favor of a tilt, maybe not permanent, but for quite a long time, perhaps, towards Asia, towards Eurasia. And that's what happened. So we'd get, after a few years in which um, Putin wanted to join the West, flirted with the West, whether sincerely or otherwise, he then turned and began to define himself and his state against the West, hence the huge program of um, building of gigantic new uh, architectural structures and rehabilitating old structures in Petersburg and elsewhere, uh, um, Orthodox churches and so forth. So we have a variety of, um, of uh, um, uh, changes happening all at once. One, we, the emergence of new civilization states. The second, the powerful movements within the liberal West, um, not so much actually in other in other. In, 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 not much in Russia, hardly at all, very little in China, not only because of repression, uh, uh, um, not much in India. Uh, uh, the, what we call loosely the woke movement is almost entirely in its strongest forms internal to the liberal West. We have that. Attacking the structures or wishing to deconstruct or radically reconstruct the structures of a liberal society, leaving out, it seems to me, some of its most important inheritances, which we should hang on to and extend even. Mm-hmm. But we have another point, which, I, which, of course, was also part of the fall of communism, geopolitical shift, partly as a result of Trump, that, and, and, but reinforced by this, the damage to America's soft power inflicted by the, the riots and the demonstrations and uh, other uh, expressions of the, of the world movement, which is that the, the global shift is not, I think, actually towards China as the new uh, hyperpower or the new hegemonic power. That's not what's happening. Um, what's happening instead is that America has probably definitively lost its status as a hyperpower uh, and as the, the global hegemon- hegemonic power. And what's ensued is a world in which there is no hegemonic power. It's not even a binary world, I don't think, any, mm-hmm. anymore, though it may become one. Uh, it's a world uh, more like that in the late 19th century, although with New Asian and non-Western powers, being uh, which were then col- colonialized, or uh, a, game, a Game of Thrones world, a Game of Thrones world, and a world, and a world of anarchical states. Mm. Uh, and uh, so, a time that this is the third, and then there's yet one more, a time of um, uh, great geopolitical change, and on top of all that, a time of major economic crisis in many parts of the world, because all of those parts of the world that have locked down, and even to some extent, those that haven't locked down much, are facing serious problems of restarting their economies. I mean, really big problems, because one of the things we all know that um, lockdown is, and, and the virus have done is to accelerate trends that were there before, made things happen, and caused things to happen in five months, or even in five weeks. That would have perhaps, if this, if there'd been no virus, would have happened in in five years. So you have cultural changes, geopolitical changes, um, economic changes, all happening at once. And I can't see any reversion to what to, to what is commonly imagined to have been normalcy coming out of this. There are too many things happening at the same time, uh, and all happening relatively. Most of them happening relatively. Many of them happening relatively quickly, for there to be a reversion to what came before. It will be new. So when when you talk in this kind of a big sweep of history, mm. um, and that these influences of nationalism and religion, or possibly in its modern incarnation, a kind of secular type of religion, same impulse, um, it almost feels like that we're just carrying on in a sweep of history that was ever thus, um, and actually the kind of moment of where we thought the world was going to be arranged in a by different principles was a delusion all along, and we we mm-hmm. just sort of yes. history just sort of grinds on and by the same forces that it always did. I think that is true. I think I think the period of the Cold War was a period, a very abnormal period in human history because the period of the Cold War was of, I mean, there were plenty of wars during the Cold War, Korea and Vietnam, and all over the place actually, proxy wars between the great powers. 
uh, uh, but a period in which the world was largely polarized around two Western Enlightenment ideologies was very abnormal. Um, uh, what's happening now is actually going back to a much, much older normalcy, let's say 16th or 17th century, in which, um, I mean, before British colonization, um, probably the most economically vibrant um, part of the world might have been India. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly there were large external civilizations in the world, China, India, Russia, uh, even parts of Europe, if you read about them, read almost like not being European in the way we think of them today. Spain, almost a, a foreign civilization until maybe um, 20th century. Uh, but what what ha seems to be happening now, I, what I think is happening, is that, and this hasn't sort of fully sunk in in the, in the West, is that the liberal West was, it was a civilization, a separate civilization, and not the germ of a universal civilization. Because the, the dream of the, the project of the Enlightenment was not only to um, have the, what they thought of as the highest civilization in the world, the best, but the only one. Mm. You can find this in Voltaire and Diderot and Condorcet. They all thought they'd be the only one because all the others would be, any valuable things in them would be absorbed, but their separateness would be gone. They liked some civilizations more than others. They liked Confucian China, for example. But uh, there would only be one civilization, and all the rest would go, go away. Whereas what I think is apparent now, and maybe a, a kind of subliminal anxiety that many liberal thinkers uh, and, and liberal activists have, uh, they realize that this may be occurring, but they don't want to think it through, is that um, the, the liberal West is not only internally troubled, it's geopolitically and in civilizational terms shrinking and discovering that it is one civilization among many. That's a, that's a big change. I mean, that's not just a change like 68 or um, 1989 or even 1848 or maybe even 60s. <laughs> Uh, um, glorious revolution uh, and uh, the English Civil War. It's one of over several, several hundred years of uh, Western hegemony, whether in a, in, a, in, a, in a religious form, specifically religious form, um, the conquistadors, the uh, dissenting religious communities that emigrated to America, I suppose they all thought that their civilization would become not only the top one, but also the only one to a situation now when um, it's becoming, I think, more clear that uh, um, if a liberal civilization survives in the West, as I hope it will, you know, that it won't destroy itself um, through developing a kind of hyper-liberalism, which the, good, the, the precious and valuable parts are forgotten or even destroyed, and some of the evangelical quality of liber that liberalism is also have is turned against liberal society mm. itself. If we survive, it will be in a world in which there are other regimes, other civilizations, and other uh, other ways of ways of living. And that's actually hard for most parts of the political and cultural spectrum to accept. Even the, the woke movement somehow thinks it's morally superior to anything else. So. In it, society, it, or in the world, even. What's interesting, though, is you, you said that those kind of um, liberal forefathers had this great vision of a universal society. Yeah. Um, and the world we, we now have, if the kind of waters of liberalism recede, they've mm -hmm. left the, uh, the kind of appearance of liberal, the liberal West behind. So, you know, all of the capital cities around the world, whether they're in South America or China, many of these cities look quite similar. Mm -hmm. um, the technologies are the same, the a sort of unified financial system. So it succeeded in sort of conquering the world um, and giving the world a particular appearance. But what you're saying is that even though it may have kind of Western liberal clothing, a lot of these other civilizations will either reverse or develop to being very distinct once again. Well, that has happened already in the case of Russia, hasn't it? I mean, unless one thinks that some people still do that, it will revert relatively soon to becoming again a, an adjunct of the liberal West. I don't think it will. I think there are hardly any ten, even when Putin goes, I don't think that will happen. Uh, um, uh, or unless you think China post Xi, Xi Jinping will do something like that. 
I think they're going to remain different. And indeed, once these leaders have gone, they might become even more different. They might dig more deeply into their own traditions and uh, and histories. What they will come up with, as I've said earlier, of course, will always be some to some large extent, perhaps politically deformed, deformed by their own needs, by their own the needs of the ruling elites to secure uh, the support of their uh, population. They will always be mixed in mm. in that way with um, uh, with politics and, and 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 power. But I don't see why one needs to think that. Um, um, the uh, s surface similarities to which you rightly point of um, uh, all the big cities in the world. Why they, in fact, one of the puzzling things is that they, they, they increasingly don't reflect an underlying s s similarity of, uh, of values and, and, and of culture. They're different. Of course, even there, there are um, uh, disintegrative trends. I mean, for example, some people think that the internet will splinter a splinter net that the internet will not be the global. It already we know it already. Yet. Well, China, the Chinese internet is already increasingly separate from separate. Western internet. And Russia might is attempting the same thing on a smaller uh, uh, basis. It's even conceivable to imagine European and American internets split, splittering in that way too. If the two, if, if 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 they continue to drift apart, which I think they will, regardless of whether. Uh, Trump is um, uh, re-elected. Um, so um, these are uh, uh, processes that I think will develop. And of course, if as a consequence of the virus, if, I don't know, um, uh, uh, human mobility, physical mobility, the, the enormous mass mobility, despite borders, that has been uh, uh, developing over the last 10, 20 years, if that's curbed, if it stops increasing or even reverse, reverts to some extent, not meaning necessarily economic stagnation, but more connectivity by virtual uh, mm. means, maybe more connectivity between artificial intelligence and robots, but physical human beings not moving around so much. That will also create, in a sense, separate civilizational zones that interact they're not separate the way they were, let's say, in the Roman Empire, when the Romans perhaps knew that there was something like China, but didn't know what it was. They knew about, uh, uh, they, they won't be separate in that way. They, they will interact. They'll know a lot about each other. They will mm. trade, perhaps, at a high levels, and so on, and even on conflict, too, uh, with, with each other. But they'd be more separate than they've, than they've been in the past. So the idea that what's coming is, uh, convergence on values. If you ask what's behind all these all these philosophies, which go back right into the 19th century, that the world is going to converge on a single regime. Uh, uh, Marx thought it was communism. Mill thought it was liberalism. Auguste Comte thought it was technocracy. Um, uh, practically everyone, some thought, thought uh, both. Um, Herbert Spencer thought it would converge on laissez-faire liberalism. His Secretary for a while, um, Beatrice Webb thought that, then she decided it was Soviet communism. There's a lot of disagreement and diversity on what is the goal. It's inexorably. They all say it's inevitable, or it's completely inevitable that the world's going to converge on some single regime and un underlying that some single set of values. And yet it hasn't actually converged on any of them, and I don't think it will converge at all. Okay. What we're seeing now is rather a kind of um, uh, a, a consolidation of divergence, uh, which is stronger, I think, than the um, superficial, uh, uh, they're not really superficial, so let's call them visible, stronger than the visible manifestations of similarity that you say, all airports are the same, mm. are the people who go to these airports and are the forms of life that they take for granted and they, are they the same? I don't think so. But do you, do you regret the passing of the universalist dream and more and more people seem to be kind of clear-eyed about what you're talking about that actually we are moving into a world of kind of tectonic plates and and some degree of separate civilizational zones as you call them is this something we should regret or celebrate or feel neutral about what's your view i think it had um the costs were larger than the liberal universalist and certainly the communist universalist or the Jacobin University, the costs were much greater. I mean, not only in human life, huge um, killings of enormous numbers of people, huge eclipses of liberty, 
forms of slavery uh, and uh, destruction of what was valuable in the earlier civilizations that they thought were done for and they were going to be swept away and be replaced by a new, new, civil, a new, new universal civilization. In general, I'm quite uh, opposed to um, secular evangelism to uh, whether of any form, including liberal. I mean, one of the reasons I was so strongly opposed to the Iraq war and later to the uh, intervention in Libya is not only that I thought they would be disastrously unsuccessful, but also because um, I think the idea that you can simply uh, impose a set of uh, liberal values on a society that doesn't have the same religious history as, as Western Christianity had, from which liberalism, I think, largely emerged and the liberal enlightenment largely emerged. Uh, Eastern Christianity didn't produce liberalism. So it's not necessarily just a Christian thing. It's to do with Western Christianity, not even with the solipsism, but actually with Reformation Christianity is what eventually produced liberalism, uh, including its, its good things. Now, where I do um, uh, regret what has happened is that it seems that at just the moment when alternatives to uh, liberal civilization seem they may not be attractive to many liberals, but they're emerging and they might engage large numbers of people more so than radical versions of Western ideology like communism. It might be longer lasting. How long did communism last? 70 years, 80 years? I mean, not even that. It doesn't exist in any real sense in China except as a, 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 a power structure, except as the Communist Party as a kind of disciplinary power structure. There are practically no strong intellectual or social movements in the former communist world. They only exist in the West, and so uh, in a small way. Um, so, uh, but what I regret is the way in which there's been, I think, a relatively large um, and, and powerful um, movement in the West to curb or even ditch the best parts of liberal civilization, um, which actually have something to value, not only for us, but for the whole world. Because if you say, well, where did the liberal project come from? Uh, uh, and what was it about? I think it emerged in um, early modern Europe as a response to the wars of religion. The liberal um, question then was, how can people with different religious, religious beliefs and values, different, uh, even within the same religion, worship, worshiping gods that are at war with seem to be one another, mono, clashing monotheisms, how can human beings um, live together? How can they achieve some kind of modus vivendi with these profound differences? To my mind, rather than a theory of rights, rather than a theory even of universal progress or of a universal civilization, that's what is the core of liberalism. And it's connected also not only with tolerance, but um, with uh, the unrestricted pursuit of truth, the importance of truth and fact. Uh, in other words, it's connected with the view in which truth is not um, a, a construction of a political project or of a theology. It's something that human beings need to strive for. I think that's extremely valuable, and that's the kernel of liberalism, which is, which is still worth hanging on. The difficulty, I think, is partly psychological for many liberals. Once they feel that a liberal civilization isn't going to become universal, once they, they fall into despair, that gives their life a meaning, especially if they're secular liberals, liberals who are not Christian liberals or monotheistic liberals. It, gives it, it, it drains their life of the meaning it used to have. They thought they are in the vanguard of a universal civilization. The arc of history. The arc of history. They were always at the, at the arc of was sort of going up. It might not be inevitable. Mm. Take periods of set, setback, setbacks, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, but it was that was where they were. They were they were in the vanguard of the human species. And of course, it's it's damaging not only to their vitality and zest for life, but also to their vanity and their uh, um, uh, conceit of themselves as being the wisest, the most intelligent, the most enlightened human beings the world has ever produced. And that, of course, is, a, is a, an unpleasant feature of a certain kind of liberalism, the idea that, um, uh, you know, compared with them, Pascal, um, 
Maimonides, uh, uh, Al Ghazali, uh, Pascal, as I mentioned earlier, Dostoevsky, uh, all these great non liberals of the past are just fools. They are emerging um, as uh, they've emerged, the liberal uh, uh, enlightenment uh, uh, projectors have emerged as the cutting edge of history. That's absurd. And that seems to I mean, me. The, 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 it's unexpected. worth mentioning the, the sort of statue toppling. Yes. Happening around the world in that context, you know, revising, looking again at former people who probably considered themselves liberals at different periods who are now unacceptable. What's happening now is that liberalism is not exempt from the um, extremism that can characterize other movements, because what we're seeing now is what I've called hi a hyper liberal phenomenon in which certain demands of liberalism connected with. Um, uh, reducing or abolishing power structures, achieving high levels of individual autonomy uh, um, and of non-discrimination. All of these very important are demanded and promoted, in many cases, no doubt rightly, um, without the recognizing the importance, the, even the indispensable contribution of background values and in institutions and practices that made this possible in, in practice, that made the progress of the past the progress is actually possible, and they included religions and national cultures, but also these vital institutions of um, to practices of tolerance and institutions of free inquiry. They were all part of what made a liberal way of life possible. If you only emphasize the emancipatory aspect, and you think that these other aspects are either not important or were even forms of oppression, structures of oppression, then you get hyper-liberalism, which doesn't last long defeats itself, produces, I think, uh, anarchical results, conflicts, and so on. And from anarchical results, what you get is um, Hobbes, Hobbesianism, because there is another, by Hobbesianism, what I mean is a demand for at least the minimal, the minimal basis, the, min, the minimal, minimal level for law and order. That's what I, uh, and it can happen really quite quickly. So I think everything is still very uncertain there. And even if Biden... Uh, does uh, win the presidency, there will not be a centrist restoration, I think, uh, because some of the trends that he's exploiting are deep-seated. I don't think it's possible for, actually now, probably for a party in America to come to, to, come to power. It might later develop in this way, but to come to power on a ticket which says, um, we have nothing to fear from China. Mm. I don't think that's possible. That's just one example. It's not possible for a party to come to power and say, we want unrestricted free trade, global free trade. No. But uh, I mean, at the very least, though, a Biden victory would put the brakes on the pace of change, would, for, would it? Perhaps for a while. It depends what would happen in the rest of the world. Might Putin become adventurous in Europe? Baltic states, for example. Uh, might... Um, uh, Xi Jinping uh, enforce a, a bloody uh, um, settlement on Hong Kong. Uh, what about the conflict which is mentioned but not really examined uh, in the West between um, India and China in the Himalayas, in, in, in Ladakh? Any one of these um, conflicts could, could, could change the world again. So I, this is, goes back to the start of our conversation, Freddie, that um, I think there are too many big and uh, potentially very uh, large changes interacting together with each other around and within Western liberal societies for this to be just something that's going to blow over. It's much bigger than 68. Nothing much happened after 68, after all. The student revolutionaries and graduated and went into the jobs market. Um, uh, there, was, there were cultural changes, but they were not enormous. There weren't large-scale geopolitical changes. And there wasn't the move, which there now is, to civilizational divergence. Um, of course, if you're a liberal, you know, of a certain kind, you would say, well, it's not real. It's just a power play. Actually, everyone wants what we want, what we have, which is freedom. But actually, a harder argument to make now that we, in the West, freedoms of thought and expression are being snuffed out or curbed by dogmatic orthodoxies of, of, of various kinds. Not as plausible. I mean, 
it's odd to say that the, the, the world is still underneath converging on a form of life in the West, which is semi-disappeared in the West. So it sounds, I mean, we talked a bit about America. I wonder if we could talk a bit about the UK in this context. Um, you know, it sounds like this kind of, if there's not an inexorable move towards convergence or progress, there mm. seems by your account to be an inexorable move towards a kind of continuation of quite rude forces in competition um, mm. and that we're going to have an unsettling and quite sort of challenging future, whichever way it goes. Is that a fair sum? It, it seems a, a wee bit bleak, John. Well, I, I, my response would be anyone who thinks these problems are susceptible to um, any complete solution doesn't understand them. That um, their forms of um, uh, fracturing, if you like, um, in the world uh, at a unique historical moment, which um, poses a unique set of questions. We've never had a world of modern states, which was civilizationally separate. Uh, liberalism does have the characteristic, not of a falsifiable theory, but of a, an eschatological hope. If you say, but look, there's no evidence that people, that these countries are moving towards it. Ah, but it's in the long run, there will be. There must be. Well, why must be? If we look back at history, don't we see lots of regimes? Think of how many regimes uh, and religions, Persia, what we now call Persia, has had. You know, Zoroastrianism, Polytheism before that, Islam. Uh, if you look at the longer, not the last 300 years, if you don't just have the narrow focus of most contemporary thought on the last 300 years, which is inevitably focused on Europe and America and its colonies, and to some extent on communist regimes, which, although they happened in, although they were set up in other countries and other cultures, actually, were projections or extensions of Western thought of Marx and of the Enlightenment and so on. If you move, if you think longer, if you go back and further and further out, not of 300 years, but of 3,000 years, let's say, uh, you'll appreciate that this moment of ours is a, is a, is a, is a very big one. Um, if history is indeed cyclical, and I think it is cyclical, although the cycles are now um, abbreviated in many ways, uh, and complicated by technological revolution as well. Technologies are changing really, really quickly now. But I just still think it's sick of them. Then some other orders will emerge, not necessarily universal uh, over time, uh, and um, could last for quite a while. But for the moment, and as far as we can see, I think it's reasonable to uh, have as our uh, goal, not the, in, not, the, not the institution, or some people would say restoration of a, of a liberal order, but of a kind of um, modest vivendi dealing with these challenges to liberal values and trying to preserve as much as we can in this kaleidoscopic circumstance. What's the value of it? Creating niches that will last. One of my mentors and inspirers in the way I think was Isaiah Berlin, and he took the view that most basic human problems, if they involve um, conflicts of values, are not soluble at all. But you can achieve a kind of uh, partial and temporary compromise, decent compromise among them as you go along. Or as I put it less profoundly, perhaps, I, I said really, politics is not, does not consist of projects of universal emancipation or universal order. What politics is, is the search for temporary and partial solutions to recurring evils. Mm. And I think what we've learned now is that these evils can actually, some of them, pop up within liberal cultures as a kind, as a result of a, uh, a, a kind of hyperbolic form of liberalism itself. While the rest of the world is evolving, developing, developing new technologies, becoming in many ways very competitive, liberal societies have focused on themselves and their own, and often, often very real. Um, shortcomings, but in a way which sometimes involves the uh, deconstruction of, or the, or, or the uh, devaluation of actually what did produce them mm. as, the, as the liberal societies they used to be. When you think about the UK, 
you know, we are leaving the institution of the European Union. Um, there's a lot of controversy as to our relationship with America, which is clearly a place in philosophical trouble as well. Mm. What, what do you see the sort of opportunity or the best play for the UK in this tumultuous moment? The best play for the UK is the maximum strategic freedom. Because we live in a world where we don't know the power structures, what the power structures, the geopolitical structures will be even 10 years from now. If Bush is, if, uh, sorry, if Trump is re-elected, will he carry on pulling troops out of Europe? Will he just cancel the basis of the post-war global order, the very, the most fundamental basis of it, throughout the Cold War and after the Cold War, in the post-Cold War period, with the American guarantee to Europe? If he's re-elected, will he, will he pull that pull out? It's certainly a realistic possibility that that should happen. If he's not re-elected, will he challenge, will he contest that result and produce a kind of um, ghastly stasis, a paralysis of government in America in which it couldn't protect anyone, even if uh, there were many people in it who wanted to. It couldn't deliver on its uh, uh, global contracts with other states because it was too paralyzed itself. That's one possibility. Will there be adventurism from Putin? Will he say, well, this is the moment to get back um, to do in the Baltic states what he did in uh, Ukraine? Um, or not. Maybe, maybe he gets ill. Maybe he leaves. Maybe he's replaced by someone who's worse. Quite possible. Uh, just as hostile but less rational. Or he's replaced by someone more mollifying, more conciliatory. Also possible, though I think unlikely. Uh, and similarly with China. So given that we don't know any of these and can't know, actually. The best thing is to have the maximum strategic flexibility to make decisions as we go along. It's not quite a philosophy, though, is it, uh, John, just to be um, nimble and sort of make the best of things as they happen. I mean, I think that's, I guess that's the strategy. But do we not need to have some sort of unifying or big ideas as to what our you know, this phrase you always get is the role in the world. What, what role in the world should the UK have? Um, do we just sort of stay, keep, keep to ourselves and um, try and make the best of it, it sounds like? Not necessarily keep to ourselves, but I mean, I, you know, the, I think the idea that we can, that this country, or any Western country, actually, I mean, French politicians are very big on gigantic global visions for France. In the last few generations, haven't come to very much. They played, they all played a noble role in the Second World War, but after that, and indeed in resolving the Algerian situation later on. I think that if we could, um, I wouldn't say restore, because that sounds too nostalgic. Um, if we could um, promote and maintain uh, a culture of tolerance in this country again, that would be a great achievement if that were possible because it would show that it is possible in a modern state not to have, not to be divided permanently and irrevocably and deeply on, on value issues. That, if we could do that, that would be a great achievement, I think. And uh, that may be possible. That may be actually possible. I think it's, at any rate, more possible here than in the US. Yeah. Because all the empirical data and the history of slavery and uh, the very history of the United States um, shows, I think, deeper and more intractable divisions. Uh, I'm not sure what is and is not possible there now, but it might be possible for us to do it, and that would be an enormous, enormous um, achievement. But in general, I think we should avoid universal uh, project and visions. I mean, if, if we could achieve, as I say, a m more of a modest vivendi, more of tolerance, more of genuine, genuine un unfettered inquiry, that would be a great thing, and others might take some inspiration for it if they wanted, or they might decide to ignore it. You actually can't control that anymore, but it would be something. Mm. Uh, and I, I'm, all, uh, I'm all for um, relatively modest visions in politics. Um, uh, big ideas tend to have big casualties. That was the, that was the, that's been the story of the last century, or uh, certainly the 20th century. Um, uh, when people say, what's the next big idea? I say, well, whatever it is, I hope I don't hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I, and I certainly hope I'm not, um, I'm not, it's not applied on me uh, because uh, it's almost always very inauspicious. It's like um, you know, having your, your identity defined by someone else. It's, 
generally not very auspicious. We're nearly out of time, so let me yeah. see if, if you can kind of um, look back on your own life and on the, the sort of decades you've been thinking about these things. You've sort of lived through the high liberal era of globalization, and uh, you know those those decades have been extraordinary in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that your children or grandchildren are going to have a better time of it or a worse time of it? Well, let me go back um, a few decades and I'm trying to answer that by reference to them. When I departed from uh, the Thatcherite right, I suppose what we now call the neoliberal right, the chief reason was that um, although it had begun actually uh, as a project to do with Britain, but also as a, an anti-communist project, as it developed, and certainly by the time that Thatcher left um, after the fall of the Berlin War, it had developed some of the features of Marxism itself. It had become a project that claimed to be universal. Uh, it claimed that not only was free market were free markets and a more limited state, uh, uh, not only would they be beneficial in Britain at a particular time and place which I actually think, still think they largely were, but that they were universal, universally applicable everywhere in principle and forever. So what was to me a, 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 an adjustment, Thatcherism, it was an adjustment to the circumstances of Britain in the 70s, basically, and uh, an adjustment to the collapse of the post-war settlement, which had happened but before Thatcher came in, uh, in 79, it had happened in the mid 70s, uh, with uh, uh, the IMF crisis and Labour being unable to deal with the British economy and so forth. Um, not any, it wasn't that anymore. It was a universal ideology of human liberation, and they were there. That's what I'm going back to. Earlier, that's what I'm categorically opposed to. Human circumstances are too complicated. Not just too complicated, too entangled with paradoxes in which some evils produce goods and some goods produce evils. That's, uh, it, it's too deeply entwined and difficult, um, uh, as Immanuel Kant, in a sentence often quoted by Isaiah Berlin, used to say, no straight thing comes from the crooked timber of mankind. Humans are too complicated, too paradoxical, too inwardly conflicted in deep and profound ways for any political formula to be universally applicable. And once you start applying formulas uh, universally in that way. They always carry big human costs, big human casualties. So that was why I uh, jumped off the bandwagon at the point of maximum success for that bandwagon, when it was going the quickest and it was the biggest and it was the most popular. That's to say 1989, 1990, 1991. I started being skeptical and doubtful as, uh, and published things along those lines from about 86, 87 actually. But I jumped off then when it was actually at its peak, because that was the peak of hubris. That was the peak at which one could see clearly that what would, ha what would happen then would be a series of disasters thereafter. And so within what a uh, decade, uh, 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 you had a neoliberal period in Russia turning into a period of new authoritarianism. It didn't take very long. Uh, 2003, catastrophe of Iraq, uh, another hubristic uh, uh, project. Uh, then uh, later on, the financial crisis and uh, Libya and, and so forth. So uh, I would uh, I would say that um, it would be better to to approach the future um, with uh, sober and open eyes than to swallow the any recent uh, um, gospel of universal liberation because they they pretty well all in especially in present circumstances end badly and. Nowadays, they end quickly. Uh, so my advice to young people would be develop a greater capacity for disbelief. You know, people say, well, if you can't have belief, if you can't have faith, if you can't have, uh, uh, then you have despair, then you have nihilism, then you have no hope, people can't go on. I mean, it's not sure that it's actually the case. You can't really live well. You can't really survive in a rapidly changing and paradoxical and partly chaotic world. If your view of the world is governed by the need for comfort or illusion, uh, uh, you, you stand a better chance of living a, a decent life, a good life, 
if you have a capacity for disbelief and so on. everyone around you is saying that such and such a thing will be wonderful that it can happen quickly that defunding the police police is a wonderful idea forget what's happened whenever that's been done in the past whenever what's happened in the past it practically always disaster or they say a complete clean sweep of our institutions will uh, produce a much better world never happened before it usually produces something even worse if uh, if you can retain those, if young people can kind of retain those observations, those insights, uh, chastening though they may seem, they'll have, I think, a, a, a more successful chance of living with some freedom and some dignity and, um, uh, and, 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 and some happiness. John, thank you so much for that. That is a taught course of uh, both the, the geographical structures and also the structures of ideas that uh, we currently find ourselves in the midst of quite an important and changing moment of. So thank you so much. That was uh, Professor John Gray, Emeritus Professor at the London School of Economics in European Thought. He was sharing his ideas about everything from how we got to where we are to what we need to do going forward. So there's a lot to chew on, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Uh, this was Lockdown TV. Thanks for tuning in.